Okay, clickety-clack, the show is on the road. Oh, one of these days we'll have sound effects on all of this, but we're still uh, running amok. Remember telephones, remember typewriters, QWERTY, remember analog clocks, isn't that exciting? Wow, welcome to the 21st century, and welcome to Evolution Hour, and there's the Trouble in Paradise logo, and Tartuca and WordPress.com, and my obligatory comment. If you haven't looked at my work, do it, and let people know about it, uh, otherwise it doesn't do diddly squat good. Okay, we'll do our little stop share, and I can close that off to get more of my memory cleared up here. I'm a pathetic little wretch. Jackson's here today and uh, as a, a feedback person, and also you can keep an eye on the live chat, too, to see the, what's going on, uh, just in case I miss anything. As usual, the main subject and the reason why I've got a, a Roman numeral that keeps growing on this thing is that we're discussing the Contested Bones book. Uh, that a uh, anti-creationist had sent me saying he didn't feel like looking at it because it made him vomit, the idea of it, but he would buy it and send it to me. And since I have relatively little money to buy these things on my own, uh, I say, hey, that's a perfectly good idea. Uh, and so he sent the book to me and I have been doing a source analysis for the low these many weeks, uh, tracking down the original source material because the book had no index, it had no bibliography, that's often very worrisome. Uh, for those of you who have been following, uh, oh, I see Brian says hi. Um, that uh, um, for those of you who've been following these last weeks, there's a refrain uh, that is recurring, and that is that Rupi and Sanford are uh, authority quote miners. They're misrepresenting the source material by stepping around data that they don't like, and they're still at it. They're just finishing up the RD chapter. Uh, next uh, uh, week will be Homo habilis. Isn't that exciting? We'll finally get to that chapter. But anyway, they finished up with a series of repetitions where their view is that Artipithecus Ramidus is just an ape, and they authority quote like mad to imply that. The problem is their sources aren't quite saying what they think it is. And one of the ones, the 2015 one uh, put up uh, to um, uh, Sergio Almecia, I'm assuming it's pronounced something like that, um, in from 2015 that they authority quoted on just a tiny aspect. I think it had something to do with a particular bone that was ape-like. But the problem is if you read their whole paper, you see the cladistic chart they show where it's Artipithecus is directed, nested right next to the Australopithecines. They are not classified as an ape in their own analysis. And this includes Sarmiento. I think I think he was one of the, the co-authors. He's been one that the uh, that Rupi and company have been um, uh, authority quoting like mad because Sarmiento and his group are the ones that um, don't like uh, so much bipedality indicated in the animal. They're not absolutely refuting it, but they're they're skeptical about its ground bipedality. Uh, but even they are placing it close to the Australopithecines in the hominids, not anywhere in the apes. So uh, it's absolutely incontrovertible that uh, Rupi, who is the point man um, in the team doing the book, um, either doesn't read the sources clearly or is so enamored of authority quoting that he just zips past it all or is directly misrepresenting information. And I also put up another uh, a post to... Uh, uh, all of the Shreve. above. Yeah, all of the above. Uh, Jamie Shreve um, on um, uh, a 2009 coverage on the case where, again, he was authority quoting only those parts that fit the anti-human uh, narrative and uh, avoiding all the other information that was saying that it, 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 we now know from the 2018 advantage that um, RD and the bunch that are occurring before the Australopithecines are suggesting that bipedality and a lot of features that were thought to be unique to the hominids are popping up in a variety of groups. And this is way more interesting, frankly, and, and should not be terribly surprising when you understand how the dynamics of whole populations are going. So as more data blips get on the scope, you get more stuff. Um, this went into also the Cretan footprints, which I think I may have mentioned because they cited it earlier on. So I may have alluded to it, but because they ended their chapter with it, I, I put it in directly as a link to both to the Science Daily piece, which was a perfectly fine summary, and the main paper itself by uh, Gerard um, um, oh, uh, Gerlinski from 2017. They had found these these human-like, oh boy, that, that was a dangerous word to use around creationists, uh, uh, human-like footprints uh, on Crete that date back, I think, 5.4 million years. So this is way before Artipithecus and well before the Australopithecines. Uh, but the point is, is that nothing 
in the paper suggested that these were our branch of homo sapiens, human beings traipsing around Crete uh, 5.4 million years ago, let alone the fact that Rupi and Sanford being young earth creationists don't really allow for there to be a 5.4 million years ago. So there's an awful lot of deck stacking and, and hiding the ball. And of course, all the way along, you never get what they think happened. And we'll find out whether or not way down the road, because I, I don't try to prejudge the book by reading on ahead, but it, it doesn't look like um, they're, they're going great uh, guns in ex really explaining what they think happened. Uh, on all of this. So those papers are really useful and it's fun to get at because you find out what the original material is, you find out um, the extent to which it's problematic in some cases or, and and as good science papers always will do, they'll point out the potential problems with their argument, the limitations on some of their interpretations and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, the other issue is that the overall patterns are staying the same. Roughly 40% of Rupi and Sanford's book is authority quoting. Uh, that about 40% of the technical papers that they cite, they're directly misrepresenting the content by overlooking relevant information. Uh, it should be 0% <laughs> on, on the misrepresentation thing. And so this is really high. The re remainder are not helping their case any particularly. They're just non-controversial points like that a particular animal had a particular feature. No one's arguing this. So uh, it, it's, it's just a wash. They have really nothing... Uh, that's that's rigorously structured that supports their model in part because we don't know what their model is other than everything that's not what they don't think is human is not human and is just ape and everything that's human but just what is human homo sapiens and homo neanderthalensis and all these are all and homo erectus they're all just normal people except they aren't no this this is a weird either or bifurcation thing the other thing is uh, the pattern I spotted yesterday, uh, the last week, is still holding true that their source usage per page is dropping. So it's below two sources per page average, uh, which is way below what I was doing in Evolution Slam Dunk. And it's the kind of thing that, that is a dead giveaway that they have a relatively limited source base to work off of. Uh, we'll see whether those numbers alter significantly as they plow through the remaining uh, part of the book. Uh, yeah, yes, and also below what we're doing, uh, yeah, let's let's uh, 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 unmute there and let's have a little chat about what we're doing over on our side there, Jackson. Just stuff and things. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you you vicious kid uh, suggested that we should write a book attacking the answers in Genesis answer series books. And you jumped right in and bought a whole slew of the little things. And you also bought me a copy of one of them so that I had a physical copy so we would be able to see the same text in that to work off of. And between the two of us, we're going to bite off a lot, which is nobody heretofore has done a full court press analysis of the claims being made in the answers books. There's little scattershot stuff all over the internet, but not gathered together in one place. And particularly some of these heavy guns, uh, Georgia Purdom and Jeffrey Tompkins and Nathaniel Jensen and these others and, and Sanford and his genetic entropy crap. Uh, there's not really been a full court press breakdown, particularly from a source methods point of view of these claims. So it's time and we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's very interesting because I know that we're learning more about the material than they care to learn, especially since they're, even when they do a abysmally attempt to evaluate technical research, they're skipping half the paper. So. Oh, yeah. It, it's, uh, uh, I, I'm sure you've already found out from your end, and I definitely have found that out from my end, the joy of discovery when you start reading the primary source literature that they're citing, and you're discovering all these wonderful facts and oh, yeah. data field that yeah. they're not mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Georgia Purdom's example, because she uh, data suppressed twice, I don't remember what the second one was, but the first time she did it uh, was she was talking, she was uh, referring to a paper, an actual technical paper that was talking about how novelties occur, how biological novelties occur. Mm. And these researchers were talking about these are different mechanisms. These are all these different things that are going on. And was she kind of was that one with Piliucci? 
Um, I don't remember if that's that if that was that one. Yeah, I because to... I know intelligent designers riff off of that, and people on the internet do that. And I'll, I'll check if uh, it, has it been in any. Is it in this current chapter that you've written, or is it one that you're working on? It is the one I sent you. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll get yeah. it down line because the uh, uh, it'll be fun because Piliucci had done. I can't remember who he co-authored it with, or whether it was a solo work uh, on the nature of novelties. And uh, um, I think I alluded to that in Slam Dunk. So if it's a different one, this will be fun. We can we can reference back to it on that. Yeah. yeah. But Purdy, her well, hmm. her thing was she kind of characterizes it as though the authors are being dishonest about how they're representing it. She quotes this one uh, this one thing out of context where she says, or where the researchers say it depends on how you define a novelty. And she's like, so it's all a semantic game with them. It's not really about Ooh, data. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. What? But except it isn't. It, it is all about how you define things. Uh, and, and one of the things yeah. that this is a recurring theme, not just in young earth creationism, but in anti-evolutionism generally, is that there's a, a, a weird sense of fog bank and obsession over terminology rather than what the terminology is referred to. Uh, I <laughs> think I, oh, uh, I, I put up a... Uh, an example uh, from, from a very common thing. What is a musical? What qualifies as a musical in a movie? Uh, if you put one song in, does that make it a musical? Does it have to have most of it told by songs? Uh, what? Where's the drawing line? Well, you're going to find inevitably there are ones that kind of fall in the cracks where you can't quite decide whether you want to classify it as a musical or not. That, that's exactly the situation that we get into in all syst all systematics. It's not unique to evolution. It's not unique to anything. There's always going to be something in an arbitrary framework that you have to go into what you mean by that. And uh, we've all encountered on Twitter and in other contexts these back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on definitions where they're they're just auguring in the ground on these things. And, and you need to always drag them into the specificity. What, what are you actually talking about? What's an example? So one of the, the primary methods rules that you should always keep in mind in areas when you get into these definitional ping pong matches is any concept needs to be applicable to actual data and examples. And all data you bring up needs to be contextualized into a bigger context and to have generalities on them. And if you can't do that back and forth, back and forth comfortably, you're probably dealing with a Tortukan. Oh, I found the paper. Uh, ah. The paper that was, it was a golden age for evolutionary genetics, genomic studies of adaptation and natural populations. It was by Nadeau and Jiggins. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, yeah. I think I have bumped into that uh, that, that part there yet. Uh, and yeah. all, what, what's so amazing about all of these examples is the papers are really good oh, that yeah. they're citing. And, oh, yeah, and you would yeah. never understand what the hell they're talking about from the summaries that you get from the creationists. Especially since Georgia uh, says, she makes the point about saying it's all, it's all a semantic game, but then they go on to say just immediately after that, the next paragraph is, here are some examples of novel structures that have come into existence, and they cite source after source after source. Yeah. None of it enters the book. No, yeah, none she, of it's she, in the book. She just, she's, all she's looking for is the uh, the authority quote. And and that quote mining area, that's why whenever you read a creationist book, uh, like The Contested Bones, don't be wowed by the fact that they're citing primary source literature. Uh, you get into this same area in all ideologues where, why, they've cited some work. Well, goody, uh, uh, look at it and find out whether it means what they say it does. Oh, a Puffaluffagus over there says uh, a one term that should have no debate included in the box. Uh, sadly, manufacturers uh, disagree. Uh, oh, included in the box, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, there's the counterpart of that in all scholarly analysis, that it's what you're including in your box or not. And what you find out is that when you're dealing with people that are fair and rigorous, what you get in the box is what you need to have in the box that they're covering all the subject matter rigorously and intelligently. They're giving you ways to find out, even if they're not providing conventional footnotes and that, they're telling you what you need to do that you can then follow up on your own. And if you follow up on your own, you're going to discover that they've not misrepresented anything. They've not left anything out. They've given you a fair play argument. They're aware of problems in their argument. If there is one, all of that occurs. We don't see that in anti-evolution apologetics. You don't see it in Dinesh D'Souza apologetics. You don't see it in 
anti-vaxxer apologetics. You don't see it in Holocaust deniers. You don't see it in moon landing hoaxer believers uh, or 9-11 um, conspiracy theorists. It doesn't matter the, 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 the content frame. When you're dealing with this bad methods thing, it's the same kinds of mistakes over and over again. They're, they're data selecting, they're authority quoting. And uh, uh, what I want to do, if we can have the great movement of source methods, ah, is to get more people onto that. And reporters and local people, when they're in their election, we're right about coming up to an election here in another week or so. And um, uh, too many people, uh, oh, you mentioned the funny mention 9 11 truthers because non sequitur show is doing one on them now. Yes, he always schedules things that to, to overlap on mine so he gets the, the audience and I don't, but as the case may be. Um, the, uh, uh, if more people approach these issues from a methods direction, it would be way better because everybody would have to play on the data field floor. They'd have to be rigorous about their source documentation. They'd have to defend their fact checking and all of that. And as we know from Kent Hovind to everybody else, methods questions shrivel them up. They can't answer them. They go silent. You, you tell about the, the discussion you just had on Twitter with this guy who you couldn't get him to answer a question for Lubner money. Oh, yeah, we had we were in a talk with a few other people and this guy named Mark uh, Rabich, Rabich, because yeah. um, uh, someone had had like thrown it to us uh, and this because this they were talking about being able to test evolution. He's like, well, you can't test evolution. So the first thing I asked him was, what is the definition of evolution? After an hour and a half, never got that answered because he jumped say to uh you can't have a second generation without reproduction if which appear which he says appears instantaneously to us or we think it yeah, does by that I, I i can't remember if there's somebody tagged me into the field or i got into it from some yeah. other direction you were now, but I, I got involved with it and i yeah. was just poking away at this guy trying to figure out what the hell he thought he was saying and he could yeah. never clarify what no. he thought he was saying yeah, after an hour of asking him which type of reproduction he was talking about, I got fed up and I left because I just muted the conversation. I was like, I'm not. We we I offered to talk to him, or you know, we could have talked to him uh, on air or off air somehow because I had no hey, idea. I, hey, what I make he a was prediction about. if you ever did have him on, it would be around around the mulberry bush. Uh, with him even then, and you would be tearing your hair out, and steam would be leaking out of your ears. You mean like we had with a bit of orange? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that, that that's the whole point. Is that um, I hope I demonstrate in those of you following me on Twitter. Uh, and if you're not following me on Twitter, why aren't you following me on Twitter? Uh, and remember to pick my brain on Twitter. Uh, you can tweet me and ask me stuff. I, I love answering questions is that I try to summarize things clearly. One of the dodges that pops up all the time on Twitter is one where they say, well, will you answer my question? And you're going, well, and what question was that? Well, the one I asked you, you didn't answer my question. Well, what, what question is that? Well, uh, well, you didn't answer it. Well, you, and, and they'll spend oh, 18 tweets demanding that you that answer so the question much. and never repeat what the question is. Yeah, no, yeah, and or, because uh, there was one conversation you were in with someone and I, and he was, and I got in there. I don't, I think I just saw it in my feed. So I was like, what question is it that you want him to answer? I will help you out because I know him. What question is it? Yeah. And he like blocked me or something. I was like, what? Yeah. yeah. That's because it's, it's, it's an invasion dodge. And you see the same behavior with Donald Trump on, on the kind of fog bank approaches. You can see how this has an effect in politics of where you try to deflect uh, and say, well, people say, and they do, and some say, and suddenly you're in this fog bank of uncertainty. That means you're way, way away from the data field. Uh, keeping an eye on my little uh, show here. Um, so what we're do doing in this new book, which is uh, uh, tentatively titled The Rocks Are Still There, uh, is going to be going through a, a whole bunch. How many of the books altogether? It's like four or five or more? For the... The answers, the answers book. Yeah, yeah. How many of the answers they books have, have you? Yeah, they have and, four. Uh, I have a couple older ones in addition to the newer ones there, and there's a lot of it that's posted online. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we oh yeah, the, the entirety of one through three is on their website, but four is not on the website for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, maybe it, they're afraid to let it out of the box. <laughs> I mean, they, they and, might and be like, ideally, if. <laughs> 
if our work does what it's supposed to do, they're going to be even more afraid of putting anything out on the box uh, on there. Uh, of course, it is important that people actually get the bloody thing. Uh, we're targeting for some time next year at some point uh, that we can get the thing going, and um, it, it'll be me uh, uh, constructing the thing so it's all in a um, standardized format and all of that, and, and um, so you can just write it in whatever form you do, and then I will cram it all in together and work out the line spacings and all that other jiggery pokery stuff. That's that's the fiddly bit stuff that you can worry about later. But I think it's going to be a really neat one because altogether those books trample on so many subjects. Although ferreting out just how broadly stupid they are takes a little bit of fun as you're ferreting away. You've already seen examples of where I would check back with you and say, uh, I want to know more about that. What could you give me a, sh a shot of the, you know, when you had to send me the, the, uh, the notes that uh, Purdom had given, for example, because I wanted to know more about it or I'll riff off of, 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 a, of a implication that they have. And I want to know where they were getting their stuff from. And then I riff off of that and go deeper and deeper because the source methods for me is just immediately familiar with that linkage between claim, evidence, documentation, range of documentation, read the full documentation field. And so those are layers of interaction that I go into automatically. And I've been doing it for years and years and years. So it's, it's very natural for me to do. It's not the most obvious thing in the world uh, for other people to do. And that's going to be the hardest thing to, to wean more onto that anal retentive uh, source methods analysis. But boy, it's productive because you can't feel bullshit easily. Uh, once you know the data field. Um, 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 for those who haven't seen my debate with Kent Hovind, I'm displaying full-blown source methods in going after him. I'm coming at him in, in a direction that's completely different from what anybody else has done. He's debated lots of people over the years. And one of the reasons why so many uh, pro-evolution people are reluctant to do debates is because they think a debate has to be on the old person's terms. No, you don't have to do that. Source methods can bypass that. I'm using his format and completely derailing him in that format. Format's irrelevant. It's it's to recognize the the the, the striation of of structure, philosophy, data floor, source methods. Don't forget source methods. Hit the data floor. Worry about philosophy only if it comes up. And that's the opposite from the way an awful lot of people go after this. Aaron Ra was coming at it top down. I tend uh, to crash right through the data floor. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, oh yeah, you 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 know a hell of a lot of data and you just get drawn to it like moth to flame and you but but not that that's not a good way of doing it it's that you must never forget that you don't want to let your opponent off the hook if they are almost ready to burst into flames and all you need to do is to ask a methods question and away they go and they will disintegrate right in front of you. And, and for too many people will forget that to ask the question, where are they getting their source material from? Um, so we're about, right. uh, let me let me do my, my uh, uh, plug and play here uh, a little bit before the show so we can spend more time on the camera. Uh, as you all know, I am an impoverished little dweeb that's doing this project entirely on my own recognizance for all practical purposes, except for uh, when I've got um, money coming in from the royalties to the books and or the GoFundMe. And theoretically, if I were like going on speaking tour and stuff like that, uh, I've been asking me to do that. So if you contact people about or or the, the one that's gone nowhere, you think I would be a good guest on Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Talk? Let him know. Anyway, here's the uh, RJ's tip patrons, all the people who have actually ponied up scratch on the uh, Patreon site to, to uh, help the project from the video and this evolution hour. Uh, there's Stephen Ballman. Hi, Stephen. You've been around. You're in the room. Uh, Mary Gail Beddoes and Keith Carden and Direwolf and Andrew DeWitt and Eat Meal, who's read my Phileas Fogg novel, loves foxing. Um, Yui Furmanick, uh, Mona Hayworth, uh, Hayford, uh, Hendrel, Jen B and Jody and Daniel Johnson and Ralph McFadden and Bo Holbo Rasmussen, recent fellow who li lives in Scandinavia. Uh, it's weird having connections with people all over the planet. Uh, Eric Rowley and Benjamin Sampson, uh, Simpson and Staggles and Alex Stone and Suris, who's doing the uh, audio recording of the new uh, um, the, the, the Paralogs book. Um, and then I'm also going to be doing a version of Slam Dunk that way. It'll be tricky because 
technical science work is not something that's been audio booked and I'll have to do some rewriting and stuff on that. But I know the author, I can talk myself into it. Uh, Totes Real, Everett Vincent and Paul um, uh, Williams. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Uh, I real uh, I do warn people that Patreon is a, a crapper when it comes to actually dispersing money, especially at low level echelon like me. And so for all practical purposes, none of that money actually gets to me. <laughs> but thank you very, very much for, for the effort. Uh, and for those who uh, want to absolutely help, uh, the GoFundMe.com, DCGo, um, uh, GoFundMe page, that gets to me in literally a couple days. I'd love to see like the crowd uh, do that because uh, I know there are tens of thousands of people that know about what I've been doing, but I don't have tens of thousands of supporters. I've got like 184 people on the planet so far have actually helped out on this thing. That would include you, kid. And uh, oh, uh, Richard Lensky, by the way, the Richard Lensky, he, he um, gave some money to the project fairly early on. So you'd be rubbing shoulders with some serious people. Nick Matsky, um, uh, from the, the old from the NCSE, um, uh, recognized the value of the work, but it's been super slow going. And in part because we are not the most, it's the herding cat syndrome. And uh, uh, I uh, recognize how difficult that is, but more of you out there can help, uh, please do because uh, um, this, uh, I'd love to eventually reach the stage where like I could have a better website and have it more user friendly and put video links and have things that are much more up to date. Eventually in the long, 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 long term, I'm gonna have to train somebody to do what I'm doing when I'm dead. And so this project is intended to be long ongoing. I don't want it to be a little hobby that I do from my den that disappears when I'm gone. So at the very least, We'll have some books out. We'll have material that's already out so that there's a data field that will exist independent of whether I'm struck by lightning uh, or not. And, and no system should be dependent upon people. They should be dependent on the network of social interaction. And we have all the tools available. Holy moly, do we have the tools available. So the only reason why we're not doing it is because we're not getting off our duffs and doing it. And the, the, the more we interconnect, the more we, we save everybody the trouble of you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can interact with other people to speed up the process so that you can do what you need to do and not have to spend weeks or months researching minutia that you only is repeating what somebody else has already done. That's that's a slow and inefficient way to do it. And that's that's been a disadvantage when we've been dealing with anti-evolutionists in this particular instance. The number of people that go in. When Bill and I went into the debate with... Um, uh, well, Ken Ham, he had to do it cold and he got a crash course in creationist belief by um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Josh Rosenau from the NCSE, but there's only so much you can do crash course. And everybody can concede that he could have done better in his debate with Ken Ham because there were many opportunities for really big boners being made by Ham that if he had mm -hmm. known more about the creationism literature, it would have worked. But I think there's no excuse for us not being better at our game. I think one of the comments I've heard is if uh, Ham would have actually gotten some points in if Ham weren't the world's worst debater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not that great. There are there are pecking orders of debaters. Um, in his own way, Kent Hovind is a formidable debater because he's got his patter down so efficiently. And 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 Dwayne Gish was a masterful debater uh, when he would go up against everybody from Michael Shermer to you uh, Ross. Uh, he would do quite nicely because he's good at gish galloping and he's quick on his draw. He he exploits errors of his opponents very quickly, uh, like Augustus did with um, uh, Mark Antony uh, back in Roman times. You know, the ability, it's not that you need to be infallible. It's need you need to be less fallible than your opponent in the debate context. Well, the role of source methods bypasses that. You're going after objective data field and objective misrepresentations, and you're trying to trip them up before they can get to their usual pattern. And the usual pattern is way easier to do top-down philosophy. Uh, and it's impossible to do bottom-up source methods because uh, uh, you know, test out, look, look at the debate I had with Kent Hovind. He had a whole string of his usual pattern PowerPoints all set up. You don't see it in the debate because he never got to that in the debate. <laughs> he was he was completely dang, uh, when he got around to me. So he had to spend his 12 minutes trying to improvise. And improv is not his game. It is mine. <laughs> and that's another feature 
that I think is important for people who want to become kind of activists in the field. You can't be shy. If, if you have theater experience and actual improv uh, and uh, experience working on a stage, being used to microphones, being used to talk extemporaneously with people in a way that's very comfortable. Uh, there are a lot of people I bumped into, um, people Gassian, for example, who um, is okay at the lecture end, but they're not really comfy at the Q&A. And how many people have attended lectures where you've got this hour and a half long spiel and then this little itty bitty 20 minute Q&A? Well, in my views, if I ever get to the point where people are asking me to uh, uh, lecture, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, um, I want it the other way around. I like to give a quick 30 minute presentation, which is what I did for Bogassian's class when I lectured down there about five years ago now in Portland. And then the rest of it was all Q and A. And it was a wireless microphone so I could get out into the audience, into the class and get eye contact and communicate and all that. And to me, that's a delightful circumstance. Um, you you want to be able to be comfortable in that kind of social environment and you adapt to the format. So you, uh, the one advantage about debating people that have a track record, whether they're on video or written, is you can look at their track record. And, and if they're ideologues, they probably aren't very good at originality. So you can work out what their set pattern is and be uh, prepared for it. Anybody who goes into a debate not knowing what Kent Hovind's position is going to be is, is like you go, what? Anyway, um, yeah, Brian Stevens says, Gish was not stupid, just mentally stubborn. Yeah, he was not an idiot. Is, um, <laughs> oh, Brian Stevens is funny about, funny if you know RJ and Hogan, yeah. Um, that uh, I admire in a perverse way, Dwayne Gish's pseudo scholarship. There's nobody I have ever seen in the entire literature who can ferret their way through a data field, cherry picking just the right little subtle bits to match up what they want to be true. He's a, a master of it. It's repellent and, and terrible method. It's evasive and manipulative, but I, you have to admire it for its sheer skill and his ability to, to uh, avoid minefields and to dust things up. Purdom, by comparison, is a rank amateur compared to Dwayne Gish. And it was reason why Gish was so formidable as a debater and as a presenter up until uh, his health began to fade in that. So really his 95 book uh, is one of the last ones uh, that was a major contribution in the area. And another point that that was his big effort, the evolution, the, the fossils still say no, that's never been put online. And so if you don't know about that work because you have not physically read it, a lot of, of Gish's heavy gun arguments are not available to you to be able to inspect. If you look at only the stuff that's available in the online postings, the old acts and facts uh, stuff, uh, it's a minor layer compared to the heavy stuff that you get in that last book. And evolution, the uh, or the uh, creation scientists answer their critics. I did a lot of critiquing of Gish in the old tip chapters. And so damn it all, download the damn crap on, on my tip website other, and read it. Uh, I know it's PDF, so if you're on a on a smartphone and that, you're going to be pissed off because PDFs are awkward to get to in that. But if you got a PC or other contexts, um, dive into it because it'll it'll give you some familiarity with a lot of background data. I know Pologia has looked through uh, the, the stuff as well, and uh, uh, I, I do admit that it has the old fo footnoting format, so it's wise for you to make a second copy of the the text so that you can open up the two files simultaneously. That way you can keep one to the notes and the other to the main text and you can bounce back and forth that way. And that's a little bit easier and a lot easier if you've got a big screen uh, PC rather than trying to go it around on that little itty bitty uh, thing where you can't jump back and forth. So um, uh, there we go. Anyway, we're um, a little bit past the hour now to the second half of the show, which is on another friend of ours, Evolution News from the Discovery Institute. And they uh, um, are, are beating the perpetual horse of the Cambrian explosion. Um, I'll um, be uh, putting up on my map of time here shortly uh, as a, um, um, a visual cue. Um, if you haven't heard about the Cambrian explosion, you must have been living in a cave because any anti-evolutionist worth their salt is going to bring it up. And it's been done both by young Earth creationists and the old Earth creationists and the intelligent designers. And their basic game plan is they can't explain the origin of the phyla. Ha ha. Tee hee. And um, I, I did a whole video on it. Yeah. And I allude to a subject which is the Bermuda Triangle defense, uh, which is one of the things that I brought up. I think I, I introduced it 
uh, maybe in chapter one or two, I certainly was using it by the time you get to Dynamania. Um, and the Bermuda Triangle defense was trying to, well, it was trying to explain Dwayne Gish uh, because it was the issue of you bring up fossil gaps and the lack of transitional forms without looking at why there might be a fossil gap or lack of a transitional form preserved. And it means that you're looking at the geological context. Are there rocks available? Um, are the forms available um, in the rocks? If you're if they're an animal that lives on the shallow seawater, it doesn't matter how many mountaintops you got preserved or how many um, abysmal deeps you got preserved. You need to have a deposit from the right environment. You found that out in the in the Tiktaalik case, where there was a relatively limited amount of Devonian shoreline that was physically preserved. And the one place that they hadn't looked at was way up in Canada. And so there they are trawling around in really awkward cold places and keeping an eye out to make sure polar bears don't go and maul them uh, while they're trying to dig the bones up out of it because you have to go where the deposits are. I call it the Bermuda Triangle defense because it's exactly the same phenomenon in that. So it was an easy thing to remember. And plus it's snarky and insulting. So it, it makes it a nice little comment. Um, in the Bermuda Triangle books, they'll talk about the mysterious ship disappearance of September such and so. And neglect to mention that the worst hurricane in 20 years went through the area on the night of such and so. You think that might have had something to do with the disappearance of the ship mysteriously? Yeah, it might. And so what it is, is the Bermuda Triangle defense is the failure to look up relevant material. And the example that I gave with Dwayne Gish was he was talking about there are no uh, middle Cretaceous rocks, uh, 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 transitional forms for the protoceratopsids ceratopsids in the middle Cretaceous. And I suddenly thought to myself, what middle Cretaceous? That if you look in the geological column, there's an early, middle, and late Triassic, and an early, middle, and late Jurassic, and then there's an early and late Cretaceous. That there's so few rocks around of around 100 million years old that they don't even bother with a period for it. It's just early and late Cretaceous. <laughs> That's not to say, however, that we don't know anything about that time period. Is there no, are no, few papers by uh, Bear or not uh, by Bruce at, at all that talk a little yeah. bit about it? So. Oh yeah, well, and the Paluxy River tracks uh, date to Middle Cretaceous. But the problem is Biloxi tracks are down in Texas. What you need are deposits of the earlier period up in the land bridge area in Canada and you know, British Columbia and up in that area and that's leading up into Alaska because that's where the ceratopsids are developing. They've come over from Asia and they're developing in that northwest corner of North America. And if you don't have rocks from that time frame, and we don't, uh, you're stuck because the, the animals are in functionally invisible because of that lack of uh, relevant uh, context. So the fact that you've got middle Cretaceous time frame, 100 million years old stuff from across the planet in completely different areas doesn't answer in principle your problem. The thing is, is that literally no creationist, no anti-evolutionist, no intelligent designer ever mentions the geological context of the fossil gap. Not one. I can't find a single example. And that's yeah. kind of a pattern. Taphonomy is, <laughs> taphonomy is a, one of those strange subjects that they never talk about. I mean, Kent Hovind has his canard that all a fossil tells you is something died. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I, uh, I've begun, <laughs> I've worked out what the, the reply to that is, is uh, you cannot tell whether a particular animal in most cases ever had children, although there are examples of ichthyosaurs literally giving birth at the time they died, so we can settle that ish. But the point is every single vertebrate that we've ever seen in the fossil record had parents. And every one of those had parents. And they have had parents. And pretty soon you have a whole population of parents and grandparents and great grandparents. How much natural variation can occur within that context? Ooh, the moment you have to think about that, now you can start thinking about the systematic relationships and all the other uh, 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 bits. Uh, anyway, so let's get to the exciting thing of that Cambrian. Um, I put up a bunch of different papers that were mentioned. These are all ones that the evolution news thing cited, and I put the link up to that as well. Uh, it was an anonymous one, uh, as uh, is a lot of the stuff at evolution news. That's from the Discovery Institute, and if you don't know it, um, kind of keep up with it because they're basically the intelligent design cadre. That's the castle. Uh, if you look at the number of intelligent design people that don't run out of the Discovery Institute, you can count them like on no hands because it's all the Discovery Institute for all practical purposes. 
uh, although now you're starting to find little networks of creationists that are kind of bumping into the thing. Paul Nelson has always been a younger creationist, but you get some of uh, Sanford stuff. And even, uh, oh, I think um, Denise O'Leary uh, up in Canada was touting um, uh, Jeffrey Tompkins um, stuff and uh, not his actual, once in a while, actually his AIG postings, but most of it was just a book he had done. And whether she really knows that he's a young earth creationist or not, I don't think she really thinks about it. But anyway, this particular post, there's some articles by uh, Rudy Lerose Abril uh, on uh, the ecology of some later Cambrian stuff. And this is why we want to get the um, map of time uh, screen share thing up here. Are we, am I screen sharing now? I don't think I have yet. Let me see. Oops, come not, on. Not yet. Yeah, um, I'm the old fart still trying to buttons up in here and they, and they should have a better menu, damn it. Okay, there's the infinite regress. Whee! Now everybody should be seeing the map of time and uh, you can download this whole thing. Uh, I have it up at the TIP website. I think it's kind of a handy little thing that I uh, worked out because I wanted to see the entire history of everything all on one sheet to scale and yet make sense out of everything. Now the thing we're talking about is would be on the big picture of the universe, this little blob up here, the green blob, which is bigger if we're looking at just the history of the earth. There's the beginning of the earth. By 4 billion years ago, we got uh, probably life. We definitely know early bacteria are knocking around by 3.8 or so. Uh, cyanobacteria are coming in about two and a half billion years ago, rusting out the oceans. Uh, early multicellular life is starting to show up in the fossil record about a billion years ago. And then this blob here expands outward. Now we can see some details. There's our mass extinction. There's our Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian. There's the tiny little slice at the end that's the entire history of the hominids. Um, and uh, um, the uh, Ediacara biota are popping up before 600 million years ago. The Cambrian explosion is kicking in about 540. This, the papers that Evolution News and Views were uh, linking on, we're be dating with the late Cambrian. So it's a period about 500 million years ago down to about 480 into the Ordovician. And it's showing the, the holdover from the Cambrian fauna and the development of new ecosystem relationships and the issue of whether or not there's um, uh, well, um, a suspension feeding arthropods. Um, and one of the things that even they're stepping over, keep your eye out. Uh, in one of the papers uh, where they're talking about these enigmatic arthropods, that they, they're not entirely sure what they're related to. Well, that's a dead giveaway that we're missing data field, that we've got all sorts of stuff that we haven't quite pinned down yet. And it's showing the, the range of complexity that's occurring outside of it. Another one that you want to deal with is the fancy word Lagerstätten, although I can't put the umlaut in here. Lagerstätten, it's a fancy little German word, get used to it. Uh, it's one that relates to um, the uh, issue of fossil preservation at Bermuda Triangle Defense. Because the only way that you can see soft bodied critters is if they've got one of these Lagerstaten deposits. If you, there are three big ones in this one paper, the, the, the La Rossi Abril stuff is about this uh, Weeks formation in Utah that's uh, a, a lager state in class and it's got some really neat stuff. It's not enormous yet. What, what we'll find out as they start excavating into there or if they do, it's basically stuff weathering out of cliffs as you can see in the pictures. Um, even though it's much later in the Cambrian. Um, that if you remove those lager state, and there's three main ones in this new Weeks one, You've basically got trilobites and nothing else. Trilobites have sh shells. So they're the reason why the trilobites were the ones that Darwin knew about. That was the age of trilobites uh, because they were molting their little carapaces over and over and over again. In fact, many, many uh, trilobite deposits are just the molted cor uh, shells. They're not the trilobites themselves. And um, uh, so uh, they were showing up. But what was going on everywhere else? Well, when you got these Lagerstaten deposits, these very rare deposits that can preserve stuff, a landslide swoops down and buries a whole bunch of critters all in one fell swoop and they don't decay. And they get preserved in a level of detail that's just astonishing. So you can see the little claws and all the kinds of stuff and, and mouth parts and sometimes eyeballs and things. And um, now you can see more detail. Uh, but uh, what? how much was going on before that? There are no Lagerstaten in deposits in the right spots and circumstances to give us light about what was going on in that period before the big Cambrian explosion. 
we got a couple longer statement way farther back and they're very specialized in nature um, that um, you can phosphatize things. So little teeny embryos can get preserved. The Duchanteau deposit in China, which is um, um, Eddie Akar period. Um, and, but the problem is they don't preserve anything bigger than half a millimeter. And we know that all of the main critters that we're seeing in the Cambrian explosion, including the chordates, are soft bodied. And their ancestors are going to be even smaller soft bodied. And unless you have a lager state and you can't see them. And no anti evolutionist ever mentions this factor. And that's why it's a Bermuda Triangle defense issue. So theoretically, you can use that uh, Bermuda Triangle thing. I've got a bunch of terms that I come up with as easy ways to reflect things. The one that I've been using a lot and Jackson seen me doing is origins or bust. The that Dracula was one that I came. Yeah, the Dracula rule. Um, uh, that one is that, um, and that's the scholarly issue. Uh, supposedly, Dracula cannot enter the house unless you invite him in. But once you do, he can come in unless you wallpaper the place in garlic and crucifixes. And so in the scholarly method context, it is that you can legitimately accuse somebody of being ignorant if they don't mention the important Schmidlap paper. But if they cited the Schmidlap paper for any purpose whatsoever, even for an authority quote, you got him because everything in the content is now fair game. And that's the Dracula rule. And, and so you want to look at where, oh, you made the mistake of citing that paper. Ooh, that was a blunder because now we got the door open and can go in. On it. That's all source methods issues. Um, let's see what and stuff's going on over in here in the... Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh ja yes, Jackson, you were uh, calling attention to the, uh, the Christian's... Um, uh, cited a satirical website called the World News Daily Report a few years back because it said the Pharaoh's army from Exodus was found. Um, the problem is the real live creationists are just that dumb because you've got, um, oh gosh, I've suddenly forgot yeah, his name. It was a guy from um, my uh, class who sent me that. <laughs> well, you, you have a thing, uh, uh, his name suddenly escapes me, uh, uh, um, Whitney or Roney or something like that. Um, who is a guy who um, uh, thought he found the chariot wheels of Exodus down in the Red Sea. And no, he didn't. But it gets circumvented, and it's still cited uh, today. Uh, Wyatt, Wyatt's his name. Um, and um, Ron Wyatt. Now I, I remember why I had an R in the, in the memory bank. Uh, and he still gets cited by bottom feeders all the time. I, uh, he pops up um, in uh, Twitter feeds and that. And, and you, people, it's fun to pay attention to this bottom feeding stuff. The Kent Hovind world is the world that an awful lot of creationists live in. And knowing about that bottom feeder world, it's way below the stuff that Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research do. They were their PhD scientists with footnotes. But down in bottom feeder land, all this weird stuff circulates freely. And for, for a bottom feeder, if a website says they found um, uh, the uh, chariot wheels of Exodus in the Red Sea, it's just as good or even better than some silly old paper by Andrew Snelling with a bunch of geology footnotes. That's boring. Oh, I don't want to read that. And so it's much more appealing. And so you really want to pay attention to a lot of that stuff because you're going to bump into it if you're in a serious realm. And that means you can triage when you're dealing with people either live um, in a debate context, or if you see them in a um, haranguing a museum, or or if you go to one of the creationist museums, uh, to be able to pigeonhole people as to where they are on the pecking order. Uh, are they intelligent design versus a young earth creationist? Are they somebody that pays attention to AIG material or Institute for Creation Research? Or are they lower bottom feeder? Are they smorgasborders who are cherry picking stuff from all over the place? Uh, or can't even remember what their sources are at all. And that's why source methods questions matter. Um, that um, I didn't have to ask Kent Hovind what his sources were in my debate with him because I already knew what they were. And um, asking him to defend his source base is not something you easily do because they won't do that. And so you force them onto that field. Um, oh, yeah, the, 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 the Brian Stevens is bringing up stuff about the, the, the Turkish arc matter. Um, it was always um, a fun one about the arc because, of course, it's in an area between it, it's in a, a contentious area with its neighbors. 
So the Turkish government, in addition to the fact that they're often paranoid and now run by Erdogan, so it's gotten even worse, uh, did not particularly like the idea of people wandering around on the border with the old Soviet Union, and there's, there's national interests uh, that, that got in play. But the fact of the matter is we now have like satellite well, reconnaissance and- You know what's funny about that, RJ, is uh, when I did my video, or because I did my video, uh, the questions a theist can't answer, and then a whole bunch of them responded to that on S.J. Thomason's blog. So my question was about the flood, and one of them said that the translation of it wasn't uh, Mount Ararat, but the mountains of Ararat. So the, oh, yeah. the ark could actually true. be on, on Judy Dog. I, I called attention to it. Um, um, read Dynamania, chapter three of Old Tip. Uh, I put a lot of work into that little puppy. Uh, and uh, yes, it's it's the the the, the association with Agridagi, which is the current Mount Ararat, only started in the 12th century, and they started identifying it with that way late. Uh, there there were little sh um, small monasteries and stuff on the mountainside, so it's highly likely that some of the wood fragments some people found that they thought were from the Ark were actually leftover disintegrated pieces of little sheds that people had had there as a result of it becoming a religious shrine. Um, but the, the mountains of Ararat made a perfect sense if you think that some of the flood legend filtered through the Mesopotamians had come about from the Black Sea flooding where the refugees that came south, for those who did, others may have gone in other directions we don't know about, but that they would have gone through the mountains of Ararat, which is the mountain range that's south of the Black Sea. It's not where Mount Ararat is today. That's farther east. And uh, so looking at all the historical backgrounds and all of that and piecing together all the mess, it's a fun little subject. Uh, Old Scratch also brings up in the live chat there that the, 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 another one of the idiot claims is the one that the Smithsonian is hiding giant skeletons. And you, I get that a lot. Hashtag Gmail. Oh, yeah. The Nephilim crowd and the ones that are reading a little too much uh, Zachariah Sitchins. They've got their Anaki. And um, someone was just saying that the, the dinosaurs were actually reptiloids and Nephilim. And uh, you're going, whoa, okay. And well, at that point, you're dealing with bottom feeders because all of that Smithsonian uh, giant skeleton stuff, you're not finding that in Answers in Genesis. They're not finding mm -hmm. that at the Discovery Institute. No, 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 no. Uh, this is all internet wackalunary. And so trying to pin down what their sources are and asking the question they dare not answer, which is, did they fact check it? Um, uh, they're going to be in terrible trouble. Uh, giants in general are a fun thing to deal with because it relates to allometry and and uh, the square cube law and a lot of other stuff. And at which point their eyes have probably glazed over and, <laughs> and you've lost them at that stage. Exactly. There. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it, it, it's all a fascinating little area because uh, if you're going to be dealing with the creation evolution issue uh, with common folk, you're way more likely to bump into some nincompoop that thinks the Smithsonian is hiding giant skeletons than you do somebody who's really familiar with chloroquine resistance and has read all of Michael Behe's postings. Uh, that's, so if you, you just need to remember the demographics of it, just as I'm much more likely to bump into a Kent Hovindista than I am a Michael Beheyite uh, online or in person. Right. And right. so uh, it, uh, don't be surprised at this. Your, your brain may go, whoa. And if you are put off by reading the same claptrap over and over and over again, being a counter uh, uh, creationist is not a field you should go into because you are going to see repetition on a mind numbing scale. You're going to see secondary citations uh, up, up the yin yang that the, the odds of you bumping into an average person who has ever gotten within 100 miles of the data field is near zero. It's that bad. So live with it. <laughs> oh, okay, let's see. Um, uh, Brian is bringing up this funny that to me that the missing red-headed skeletons from the Midwest were originally reported as being in the just over seven foot range, making my next door neighbor a giant at seven foot, foot four inches. Um, yeah, you get an awful lot of these uh, folktale elements. Uh, you get it in relation to uh, cryptozoology. That's a, a, I went into this a little bit in the old Dynamania thing, so that'll show you how long this has been going on. Uh, there's a natural tendency among some bottom-feeding creationists 
to latch on to cryptozoology, which is the idea that there are cryptic animals, uh, Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot and all these others that have survived down to the contemporary day because it fits into their Bible narrative. They would really love to have dinosaurs lurking around somewhere in Africa uh, so that they would say, well, see, it was only, uh, oh, Dave Witzel, um, um, uh, Jackson put up the Reformation uh, reference on, yes, the, one of the ones that's been pushing a lot of this stuff. So knowing the difference between the uh, official anti-evolutionism of the various creationist groups, the kind that you will come into it a more official debate and what's going on at the grassroots level where you're now dealing with an awful lot of websites out there. And Ken Hovind was a perfect illustration of this bottom feeder action because he didn't go around reading technical literature on feather evolution. No, he cribbed a Harwin Yaya website it, because there, there's so many of them around there. Uh, I cataloged, I think 40 or 50 that were operational that, and virtually none of them are labeled Harun Yaya. It's only down below when you start looking at the links that you see them linking up to Harun Yaya posts. And uh, uh, so the people who are bottom feeders are very likely to just pick up stuff that looks good and trying to track down where they're getting their source base from uh, will um, uh, occupy some time. Fortunately, Kent was so deliciously repetitive where he copied the whole bloody post line by line by line uh, for his PowerPoint. It made it absolutely incontrovertible where he got it from. And he did not particularly like being called out on it uh, and uh, being referred to as a bottom feeder. So anyway, uh, if, if you like contact sports in the intellectual realm, this is an excellent thing to do because source methods is a rough and tumble sport. It's not for the squeamish. It requires that you be, uh, yes, I'm the altar boy of atheism, he called me at the end of it, Ken Hovind did. And uh, I said, no, I'm the altar, I'll, I'll plead guilty to being an altar boy for reason and, and sound scholarship. That I will proclaim. But, but I had never brought up God or anything else in the discussion. Ken Hovind no is an idiot. Does not, except him. He's yeah. the only Well, person. I mean, I'm, 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 I know, I, I don't disguise the fact that I'm not a non-believer. But none of the reasons why Kent Hovind is an idiot have anything to do with his being a religious I mean, person. Even in his, he's a scholar, incompetent. Even his discussion with Arn Ra. Arn Ra is, you know, obviously atheist. It was still yeah. only Kent who brought it up. <laughs> yeah, because from his point of view, that's all it's about. But by forcing onto the source methods level, source methods is absolutely independent of content. It's an underlying structural thing that if you can't play that game, you're a doofus. And, and if you're a doofus, why should we pay attention to you? And uh, so the, the thing, it also means that we must use it rigorously against everybody. That if I have to play it, everybody else does. So if anybody says, well, you little smart ass RJ, uh, document that. Well, if I can't do it, then boop, I'm in trouble. But as people have discovered online, I usually come in with, oh, happy to do so. Here, <laughs> click, click, click. As we were with Mark trying to send him references on the evolution of sexual reproduction, which he didn't read. Yeah, yeah. And he and, and he wouldn't at. even honestly say whether he was going to read it or had yeah. read it. Uh, one of the he things didn't. I do as a, as a scorched earth defense is I say, do you really want me to do a citation dump on the technical sources regarding the reptile mammal transition that I got in my book? And I will actually give them obviously not the whole shebang. There's 500 of them just on the reptile mammal transition. So I'll start with like the A's or start in the X's or start with just Lou or just Kemp and just give them, you know, half a dozen or so that they can look up on their own. It says, well, that should keep you busy for a while. Needless to say, I don't get much feedback uh, on them from that. <laughs> I mean, even with the two papers we sent him, he couldn't even bother to look at them. No, and that's what's so pathetic and lazy about it. And this is something you'll find over and over and over again, that uh, the, the ones who say, show me the evidence. But when you give it to them, they suddenly clam up and you can't get them to engage in it. Or there are some, uh, or there are a small case, number. Squirrel. Who, yeah, <laughs> squirrel, squirrel. And they will lob um, a, um, a, maybe a, 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 a technical paper. And that's another fun game to do that. The odds are, if an, if an anti-evolutionist has tossed a technical paper at you, they have probably nicked it secondarily from somebody else. They've seen it in a posting at Evolution News or at, at Answers in Genesis, and they've taken the technical paper, and they're going to throw this at you at ammunition secondarily Wasn't and assume that it means something. 
wasn't there one who shot who shot us a paper or maybe we just shot you a paper and i saw it but it was on was it development of like some organ system or something like that and he said aha our no it was some gene regulation mm. uh system and he threw it at you and and you looked it over and you're like well this is a really interesting paper it doesn't at all make the argument you're saying it does <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or there's a guy. Uh, oh, um, um, like several creationists have lobbed them, but one in particular, I can't remember if it was Jay Andrew or or one of the others, but he's just obsessed with throwing Davidson papers at me. Uh, Davidson is an excellent. Eric Davidson is an excellent scientist, and I have a ton of his stuff in my bibliography. He works on developmental biology and genetics, and and there's just a handful of these that have been popping up in the anti-evolution literature, and he just keeps throwing them again and again and again a little snippet or a quote from it and it's from this same material i've never been able to get him to discuss the content of the papers well j andrew and um genesis one something there's a few of them who are all together and they're all just crap at reading oh. anything they all hang out together yeah 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 uh, Brian says it, it, um, the thing that makes him think Kent is actually a believer in his own nonsense. I firmly believe he believes his own nonsense. I do not for a moment think that Kent has even a microsecond's doubt that everything he's saying is true. That's what's so hilarious, uh, that he really seriously believes all this stuff. Another one that, that's fun to get into on Twitter, and they're exasperating as all get out um, uh, because they're so bloody re repetitive. Uh, positivism versus negativism. I don't know if you've seen too much of his stuff. Uh, Meta Christianity is another one. I've These seen, are ones. Oh, I have. Nope. No, I have not really spoken to Meta. No, I have not. Oh, uh, uh, you're you're lucky if you don't. I was um, thinking Meta of Meta Christianity is one of these ones that they have their little tropes. And they constantly say that you can't explain such and so. And you're trying to bring up data and they never discuss it. And they'll constantly harangue you for failing to deal with things. Uh, positive versus uh, negative uh, tivism, uh, I, I acronym him is PVSN, uh, is obsessed with socialists and skeptics. Mm -hmm. And he continuously talks about leftist socialist skeptics like Richard Feynman. And and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins and all these are these leftist so skeptics. socialist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it, he's just obsessive. And you try to pin down what the hell he means by skepticism. And supposedly I'm a skeptic too. I deny reality somehow or other, and somehow skeptics do that. And uh, so I finally reached the point. Says don't. Uh, don't 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 get pushed out of shape by PBSN. It's the same shtick. He does this over and over and over again. He's got this one horse uh, game that he plays, and he uses words as if they mean what everybody else uses. So he should use acronyms or or gibberish terms like schmargleblop or snickyblob or snoopnegi, uh, rather than words that have meaning like socialist, skeptic, uh, um, uh, left wing, and all that that have contexts. No, they're not what he means. We can't figure out what he means. <laughs> And you'll just yes. go on and on and on and on and on on it. I, I can guarantee you, if you get involved in one of those threads, just leave. I you won't um, get anywhere. I talked to Epi Christ a while back um, about like antifreeze uh, glycoproteins in ice fish, and he said because he told me there are no examples of beneficial mutations, and then ran off. I never heard when from him examples of beneficial mutations. Yeah, I, I've been so... keeping a big track in my work, particularly of point mutations, uh, that not only just general ones, but ones where individual nucleotide substitutions or amino acid substitutions actually produce this. Uh, um, old Scratch uh, in the live feed says that the, the creationists are not intellectually honest enough to review the sources they ask for. They just want to keep pretending they don't exist. That is a pathology of behavior, Scratch. You will find that relentlessly. And it's the information deflecting off the Tortugan mind shell. That's what you're seeing uh, or, or experiencing when you're getting the Twitter thing. And that's why source methods questions shut them down instantly, that they can never answer them because they would have to examine their own source base. They would have to examine, uh, try asking a creationist uh, uh, or any weird ideologue, did you fact check this? And you'll never get an answer ever. 
they will re absolutely refuse to give a direct answer on it. They'll jump off to something else and you'll find all sorts of deflection modes happening or repeating their tropes over and over again. Uh, and so I make it a point of not letting them off the hook on it to where I says, oh, he has all this time and you've never answered this or all this time and you've never discussed that. And then of course I make a point of bringing up um, litmus test items, the reptile mammal transition, duh, I wrote the bloody book on it. So I know all the ins and outs and everybody out there that doesn't have evolution slam dunk, why not? Let me put the thing up. I put a link to it up in the video description. Uh, I'm very proud of the book. It's uh, a tour de force as the paleontologist Christine Jan has called it. Uh, and I'm frustrated that more people don't have it and that those who have it haven't put their reviews up. 14 reviews, come on, I know more people about the book than that. So let's let's get off the ball on this and let others know about it. Um, call it to the attention of Richard Dawkins and uh, the Center for Inquiry and Neil deGrasse Tyson and everybody else that is in the biz saying, hey, this is an important work, pay attention to it. Uh, I, I, I'm perfectly happy to say that myself, but then I'm the snarky author saying, hey, pay attention to my work because it's really good. Uh, that that comes across as highly narcissistic, but it is a good work, and I'm very proud of it. And I would like to see more have, have it president? a because it's good, and b uh, because I can get royalties off the damn thing and I can use it. So uh, so there we go. Anyway, there's a direct link to that. And it's available in ebook format, and I will be wanting to do an audio book of it. It'll be tricky to do because, of course, you don't have references in there. I'll have to put up like a file of the reference material and find ways of alluding to it in the narrative that people can locate them easily in the reference base once that's structured. But that's that's just a matter of, of formatting. Uh, it's not a matter of having to research the content. And I might jump in maybe and do a revision on the fly. I don't know whether or not I, I, I can spare time to be able to take on that task of, of doing a functionally revised edition for the audio book format. But I might. It all depends on <laughs> I got my bills up to speed or not on that. Anyway, um, so uh, the upshot is that we've got a bunch of sources that we put up and um, everybody can um, take a look at all that. And we've uh, um, beat some horses today and discussed stuff. Uh, if you haven't seen the Kent Hovind debate, please do so. And uh, if you can help out in the project at the GoFundMe and all, all that, uh, can rattle, can rattle. So um, I think that's got everything on there. Uh, um, uh, Brian put up a link to a, a YouTube on phylogeny. Uh, that's an area that's intimidating, but it's immensely fruitful if you dive into it. It's the family tree of life. It's why certain things are related on other things and find out what's convergent and what things have come up and how the panoply of life has shifted so spectacularly over that big map of time. And you realize that one, one good heuristic to keep in your head is if you pick any arbitrary point in the past and draw a time slice and envisage what you know existed because of the fossils and what you can infer existed because of what exists in other deposits and at the same time. And then you start moving either backwards from there or forwards from there. You're going to start seeing things getting differenter and differenter and differenter and differenter and differenter. Not necessarily better, not necessarily worse, not necessarily beelining towards any destination, even though individual lineages will end up in the long term places. Most of the things are just microevolutionary speciation. But the point is, is that there is no static and there is gradual shifting over time. And if you look at the reptile mammal transition, as a archetype example, stepping back to 300 million years ago and then getting down through the Permian mass extinction at 250 and then down into 150, now you're into dinosaur times and down in, uh, uh, now you've got full blown mammals. But there is no point anywhere in that fossil record, even the limited one we have, where there's any abrupts. There's no big things appearing poof out of the middle of nowhere. There's almost and a little bit more like and a little bit more like and oh, now we're even more like uh, that sure looks like evolution to me. <laughs> so that's why the reptile mammal transition is one of the critical, delicious examples. It's It's got a richer record of stuff and it's us. It's not the cousins next door with the birds and the dinosaurs. It's our actual origins. And it's way before you get into the primates and all the stuff down to the hominids. It's, it's an immensely interesting area. They're not as sexy as the dinosaurs, but they're really extraordinary. And uh, they cover a long period of time. They were the dominant land animals on Earth for 100 million years. 
So um, uh, let's let's give them some more thing uh, interest, and plus the fact it's a brick to throw at the anti-evolutionists. They can't deal with this data field, and I documented every example of every anti-evolutionist. The intelligent design people are even worse. Some creationists try to wrestle some of the data to the ground, and they do a miserable job of it, uh, like that that mouse <laughs> thing with the with the uh, probandic nathans. Um, but the intelligent designers don't even get that close. So if you know that data field, you'll and you got my book, you'll know every counter argument that you could possibly deliver at it. And that should theoretically improve your game when somebody says, well, there ain't no evidence for macroevolution. Oh, really? Let's talk about the reptile mammal transition. So there's my book plug. Uh, thank you all for today's show. And uh, we'll keep plugging away at things uh, as we will. And uh, bye till next week.